On the 14th day of the fifth lunar month in 1847, on the western side of misty waters at Sun Moon Lake, came the sound of oars splashing and songs in the distance. When the mists parted, it was a large canoe. This boat was carrying Liu Yunke, and his retinue was accompanied by a boat, commanded by seven or eight Tao Aborigines, paddling in harmony with their song to break the calm surface of the water. Liu Yunke, style name Yu Po, a native of Wenshang in Shandong province, was appointed governor general of Fujian Zhejiang in 1843. Under what conditions did he come to Taiwan? What did he learn in particular during his trip to Taiwan? Why did the Tao Aborigines accompany him? And what was the value and influence of his trip to Taiwan? Sometime after 2 p.m. on the third day of the second month in 1847, more than three months before Liu Yunke went boating on the Sun Moon Lake, Tao Shiwei was ordered by Governor General Liu to go to Taiwan and take her office as magistrate of Lugang under the administration of Tamshui Sub-Prefecture. Waiting for a boat at the bridge south of Quanzhou, Tao Shigui, style name Dan Nian, sobriquet Fu Tang, a native of Wenshang County in Kaihua Prefecture, Yunnan Province, was a provincial graduate of 1822. After Tao Shigui and his friends said farewell, he boarded a small boat. Guided by a southerly breeze, he soon landed at the coastal port of Tahu. On the fourth day, when winds were favorable, Tao Shigui wrote in his journal, Though there is no rocking, I feel like I'm rising and falling, perhaps psychologically preparing himself for the voyage he was about to take. Sometime after 9 a.m. on the sixth day, northerly winds rose and sailors on the large boat, Zhang Wanji, displacing 3,000 din, prepared the ship and raised the sails. At around 11 a.m., the Zhang Wanji set sail on the winds to the Taiwan Strait. By the middle of the night, they were in open seas, and the boat rocked incessantly. After six hours, Tao mustered his strength to reach the rudder room at the stern, to have a look and saw the red sun breaking over the horizon. It was not until noon that an attendant came to the cabin and reported that they had arrived in Taiwan. When Tao went on deck, he could already see Lu Gang. Sensing he had successfully made it to Taiwan, he wrote the following lines of poetry in his diary. A thousand leagues in a single day, with a fine protection and a quick wind. Lu Gang was the most important commercial port in central Taiwan for contact with the outside during the Qing rule. It flourished between the Qianlong and Daoguang reigns during the Qing dynasty in the 18th to 19th centuries. The port for boarding and disembarkation at the time lies below the archway of Tianho Temple in modern Lugang, where many traces of the bustling market can still be seen. Back on the 26th day of the 11th month in 1846, Liu Yunke, as governor general of Fujian Zhejiang, wrote a memorial to the throne that six sub-tribes of Sazun in Taiwan had offered their land as tribute in submission and invited cultivation of the land. The Daoguang Emperor, after receiving a memorial from various ministers and related high officials, issued an edict ordering Liu Yunke to go over to Taiwan in the second or 
third month of the following year and conduct a personal inspection. Carefully survey and prepare at length to report exactly on what you see. Before reporting back, do not delegate and certainly do not just listen to what subordinates say. Take credit for what others have done or be misled by others. Act accordingly or suffer the consequences. Be stern, be careful. As a result, Liu Yunke had to personally go and survey the six subtribes of Sazum and understand the request for land cultivation by the Aborigines in order to form the foundation for a policy decision regarding development. And Tao Shigui, who just happened to be going to Taiwan, was ordered by Liu to serve as his preliminary scout. Uh, 可以分作广义的水沙林那在往北的话这里原本叫做什么名称沙莲这个是一个很特殊的历史地理名词就会变成萨伦半汉的一个历史地理名词After six days of preparation, on the morning of the twelfth day of the second month, Cao Shigui departed from Fanzuhua and entered the government office. The following day, he reported and took up his post, becoming the new magistrate of Lugang. Ten days after Cao Shugui reported to duty, he began the work of surveying the land. He left for Puli on the 22nd day of the second month and ended in Dolio on the 28th day, his trip taking a total of seven days. This seven-day survey is recorded in detail in his diary, entitled Journey of the Overseas Official Futang. On the 22nd day, he left for the Puli subtribe and arrived at Jiji Station on the 23rd day. Accompanied by several military officers, he arrived at Tianhou Temple, inspecting the boundary marker beyond which entry by Chinese was prohibited. 
On the 24th day, it was sunny, and around 6 a.m., after traveling some distance, he began to climb Jixiong Ridge. The ridge is hundreds of zhang tall and quite steep. Here, he came across some assimilated aborigines. Afterwards, he ascended another ridge and reached Tu Di Gong An between the two ranges. He thereupon came to Qianzhen Lin with trees so thick you cannot see the sun, and Zhu Lin with reeds so dense they could be a fortress. This route is now known as Sazum Old Path, the scenery along it almost the same as that seen by Cao Shi Gui in his day. After going on Sazum Old Path, Cao Shi Gui and his attendants entered the Tiantou Subtribe and Shui Li Subtribe at Sun Moon Lake. Cao had the following to say about Sun Moon Lake. Five Li to Shui Li Subtribe, there is a lake. In the lake is a mountain called Zhu Zi, Pearl Mountain. The natives carry grain baskets to the surrounding hills, and there are about a hundred households in the subtribe. The Shizi, Fugu, and Maolan subtribes are also here. People in the past praised the beauty of the landscape here, with a lake in the mountains and a mountain in the lake. Cao Shi Gui thereupon proceeded to the Maolan subtribe, the remains of the Shenlu settlement, the Zhuo and Puli subtribes, and Dongjia Cheng. He made a detailed description of the population, arable land, water sources, and roads for each. When he reached the Puli settlement, the civil and military officials there, and dozens of unassimilated male and female aborigines from the Pu, Mei, and Shui Mei subtribes greeted his group. On the 25th day, Cao Shi Gui received the aborigines and had discussions with them, presenting such simple gifts as red cloth, serge fabric, paper flowers, and stringed beads, to ask the reasons for cultivating the land. Since everything was discussed via translators, Cao Shi Gui came to the subjective conclusion that the request by aborigines to cultivate the land was the result of deceit in communication by tribal guards. At noon, Cao Shi Gui went from Xin Mucheng and started to climb Hu Zi Mountain. After crossing Qingshui River, he arrived at the official's residence in the Mei Sub Tribe and learned about land cultivation there. He found that assimilated aborigines there had already outnumbered unassimilated assimilated ones. He then crossed the river again and arrived at the Jirme and Puli subtribes. He surveyed the land there as he and officials discussed where to construct a walled town. On the 26th day, Cao Shi Gui took the north route out of the mountains and returned to the place where the walled town was surveyed. Cao Shi Gui rode in a polled sedan chair carried by dozens of assimilated aborigines. Going along the river and carefully surveying both banks, they crossed the river seven or eight times, arriving at Gui Zi Tou. On the 27th day, Cao Shi Gui departed from Gui Zi Tou and Jiu Chong Lin, passed by Wai Guoxing, Da Ping Lin, Tu Keng, and Tu Zheng Zi, and saw the 1817 boundary marker on the banks of the Wu River at Pu Tu Nguyen prohibiting entry by Chinese. In the afternoon, he left Nei Mu Shan and passed by Beitou and Nanto, spending the night at the district aide's official residence. On the 28th day, Cao Shi Gui arrived in Deliu, bringing his survey trip to an end. On the 18th day of the third month, he was transferred and became sub-prefect of Tamshui. Undoubtedly, one of the strongest impressions on Cao Shi Gui must have been his first contact with Taiwan's aborigines. In his diary, he meticulously recorded assimilated aborigines in the area of Sazun. On the 24th day, dozens of aborigines who had been assimilated came to greet us. In addition to being clad in deer skin on their upper body, they also used deer hides to cover their lower body. They did not appear to be fierce, but were armed with swords and arrows. 
On the twenty-fourth day, unassimilated Aborigines with one character Zi tattoos of the May subtribe appeared almost the same as those of the Pu subtribe. The men were the same, but the women had a one character tattooed on their forehead, their ears pierced and tattooed down to their lower lip on both sides of the face in a pattern spread out. The tattoos in indigo ink. Last a lifetime, and then Wangzi Aborigines from the May subtribe appeared. Actually, it indicates that the news of Liu Yunke imminent arrival in Taiwan had reached the mountains, and many Aborigines had come to catch a glimpse of this important official. So, in six and six, the first is the eye. The eye is the eye of the village of Yuchiang. The eye of the eye. 那现在那里有两个村，一个是投射村，一个是五灯村。好，那再过来是水里社，水里社就是现在的日月潭周边地区，啊，包括现在的象山，呃，游客中心，啊，那个地方，啊，包括现在的叫做水社，或者现在叫做日月村，啊，这日月潭的周边，这个是以前的水社，然后过了水社，再来就是猫兰社。啊，马兰社的闽南话叫做巴兰，就是现在的鱼池乡的钟鸣社区。啊，再过来是省渡社，省渡社就是现在的鱼池乡的市街的那个部分。啊，这个是刚才讲的头社、水里社、猫兰社、省渡社，这个很清楚是少主的呃村社。再进来呢，就是到埔里盆地有两个社，一个社是埔社，啊，又叫做埔里社。另外一个社是梅社，那补社，呃，应应该也是属于少主系统的一个社，因为从历史的文献跟发展过程里头，补社跟水社两个都是共同参与很多历史事件，啊，他们的关系非常密切，啊，所以这个补社应该是属于少主系统的一个社。那至于梅氏，很清楚的，我们看到文献里头描述他是王志藩，就是他的额头，而是脸颊有纹纹面的风俗的话，那就是一个是赛德克，我们这周边的哈，一个是赛德克族，另外一个就是泰雅族，所以梅氏现在看起来，它应该是属于泰雅系统的一个村社。On the 24th day of the third month in 1847, more than 20 days after Cao Chigui completed his survey trip, the Governor General of Fujian Zhejiang, Liu Yunke, followed orders in the memorial to visit Taiwan in the second or third month of the following year. He began his trip in Fuzhou and boarded a ship in Hanjiang to await the seasonal winds. Finally, on the 14th day of the fourth month, he set out to sea, and the trip went smoothly as he arrived on the second day at the port of Lugang. Going to Fanzuwa in his trip, he would meet the local officials and leaders. He then ordered Cao Shigui, Ye Changchun, Deputy General of the Northern Route, and Shi Mei, Sub-Prefect of Tamshui, to proceed again and survey the situation with assimilated and unassimilated Aborigines in the six sub-tribes of Sazum. Cao Shigui and the others then departed on the third day of the fifth month, as Liu Yunke was already on an inspection tour of the three districts of Taiwan, Fengshan and Jiayi, arriving finally in Dolio on the 11th day of the fifth month. Liu Yunke, Cao Shigui, Deputy General Ye Changchun, and Tamshui Sub-Prefect Shi Mi got together again, and after Liu listened to the report of their survey, he began his Sazum journey. The Great Prophet sent Liu Yunke to Taiwan. We can also say that the Chairman sent you to do a survey search. 派你去出差，好，然后他出差来的重点就是，普里这个地方原来叫做界外的藩地，那藩地本来就不是一般的老百姓，比如说汉人可以来的，那所以在台湾做一个移民的接受的地方，人进来的越来越多，土地越来越少。那可是，在政策的部分呢，有很多是禁地，法律禁止的。可我们知道说，法律是一回事，然后实际的社会的状况又是另外一回事。至于在皇帝看不见的地方，在法律所禁止的地方，社会会有它实际的状况，去走它自己的路径。至于普里这个地方，到底
。道光皇帝觉得开垦跟不开垦，他想有更真切的了解，让他作为最高的统治者有最好的决定权。所以这一个可以说是出差的旅行，而且是实地调查的旅行。那刘云科在距离我们今天一百七十多年前，他的田野调查，他的出差的公务旅行，就带我们看到了一百多年前的埔里，看到了一百多年前的台湾。On the twelfth day of the fifth month, Liu Yunke went to Nanto, crossed Zhuo Shui River, and one hundred and twenty assimilated and unassimilated Aborigines from the Tiantou, Shi. Ko, Luan, Mao Zhu, Shan Ding, Ba Lu Tou, and Gandawan sub-tribes were there at Shidong to greet him. Liu Yunke brought representatives into the government office and asked about their reason for offering land to encourage the unassimilated Aborigines. He gave each of them an upper garment, lower garment, twenty chi of blue cloth, twenty chi of red cloth, a chi of fabric, a string of beads, paper flowers, and three catties of salt. The Aborigines gave out a shout of joy and thanks that echoed through the valley. On the thirteenth day of the fifth month, Liu Yunke. Reduced his cavalry and discretionary forces, instead taking a bamboo palanquin as he went from Jiji into the mountains. Like Tao Shigui, Liu Yunke first went to look at the prohibition markers, following the east bank of Zhuo Shui River to proceed further. After passing Fen Hongko, he arrived at Shui Li Keng. Along the way, more than 300 Aborigines came from the Shi Di, Jia Wu, Bao Lie Shun, Shui, Shen Lu, Fu Gu, Mu Ga Lan, and Shi Zi subtribes to greet him. The lineup was long, and their numbers great to reflect the majesty and repute of the Governor General Liu. Unke rewarded those from the first three sub-tribes. On the fourteenth day of the fifth month, Liu Unke and the others left Shui Li Keng and headed south to view the old site of the Shizhi sub-tribe, where Han Chinese had already entered and begun cultivating the land. They then headed west and ascended Ji Xiong Ridge, which is 500 zheng high and winding back and forth. The cliffs standing like a thousand blades, gazing at crowded peaks. The mountains tall and imposing; they are overwhelming. The pennants and flags of the Governor General's entourage fluttered in the breeze as Aborigines from many sub-tribes came rushing from here and there. When they reached Qianzhenlin, with its dense old forests, they saw trees reaching to the heavens. Passing by Junlinzi, the wind blew lightly through the bamboo forests there to make rustling sounds. Tao Shigui recorded that remote bamboo were rustled by the light breeze, and Liu Yunke called it the narrow. Path of remote bamboo. After entering the Tiantou subtribe, Liu Unke saw the Shi subtribe to the southeast, with thatched huts and bamboo fences as smoke wafted about. That's when he wrote, "Fertile land and thatched residences. What else could one ask for?" He felt that the land was rich and suitable for cultivation. Liu Yunke then went from the Tiantou subtribe, and not long after passing north of Mandan Peak, he came upon a lake in the mountains covering several kilometers. And in the lake was a small mountain. Tao Shigui wrote, after heading north and passing Mandan Peak for about two li, I saw a lake ringed by mountains. The lake covered more than ten li, and in the middle was a small mountain. The lake shore to the south was round like the sun, and at the north curved like a half. Moon. Asking the natives, I learned the name was Sun Moon, and the mountain in the lake was called Zhu Zi. The verdant peaks and white-capped waves with flowing mountain clouds made for a sight like that of the immortals. And Liu Yunke also said that from north to south, the lake is eight or nine li. Halfway across the water, the hues are evenly distributed between red and green. The surrounding peaks are verdant, and in the lake is a solitary island mountain. Its name Zhu Zi. The high grounds are rocky and. And can accommodate many buildings with dozens of Aborigine granaries in the mountains. The eastern stream entering the lake provides an inexhaustible source of water, and fishing boats are scattered on the surface, hidden among trees and bamboo. 
the scenery he saw is no longer there because Sun Moon Lake was later transformed into a reservoir and the island in the middle collapsed in the GG921 earthquake. Nonetheless, we learn from Tao Shugui's account that the lake shore to the south was round like the sun and curved like a half moon at the north, telling us the origin of Sun Moon Lake's name. Liu Yunke praised the place as a pure marvel of the landscape surpassing that of all the other sub-tribe areas. Liu Yunke traveled north of Sun Moon Lake for three li and entered the Shui sub-tribe and, as his custom, presented gifts of cloth and other items to Aborigines of the six settlements. The Aborigines reciprocated by presenting him with chickens and inviting him onto a manka canoe for a boating trip. He felt it is something not to be taken lightly and an experience not easy to come by. And with that, he boarded the canoe with his officials in attendance. Manka is the word for canoe in the Aboriginal language. The Manka of the six settlements, however, were extremely large, over 10 meters in length and more than 2 meters at its widest point. The canoes were manned by seven or eight Aborigines with oars, and behind were two other canoes with fishing nets. Whenever they went out fishing, the Aborigines would shout with joy and give thanks for the fish they caught. The Aborigines welcomed Liu Yunke with song, and the boat went over the lake, visiting Pearl Mountain, where they disembarked. There, under an old tree, they laid some grass on the ground to sit down, brewed tea, and heated wine to drink with the fish they caught. Liu Yunke and the Aborigines then enjoyed a sumptuous picnic. Having his fill of food and drink, Liu Yunke had no idea that he would witness a spectacle the likes of which he had never seen before. Cao Shigui wrote, Without warning, the wind rose and the rain came. A rainbow appeared in the middle of the mountains, one end in the valley and the other pouring into the lake. A half ring reflected in the water, like a mirror with rays of color reflected on the mass. Soon the rain stopped and the rainbow disappeared. The middle of the mountains spewing streams of clouds in every direction direction as the rainbow reappeared in the mountain tops, reflected in the water like a full mirror with verdant peaks emerging from within. The colors like before, but even more. Not long thereafter, the rainbow was enveloped in the clouds with the setting sun's rays from the west as the moon rose from the mountains. With the arrival of evening, the entertainments for Liu Yunke and company did not stop. They raised their cups and drank wine, discussing how to satisfy the Aborigines. Mixing business with pleasure, they broke into verses of old poetry, everyone in a joyful mood. Cao Shugui wrote that Liu Yunke knew the pleasures and sorrows of the people all the time, his nature in accord with the heavens. Liu Yunke had a natural talent for breaking down barriers of language and culture to take note of people's feelings, which others observed and praised as well. Liu Yunke was an astute observer of the Aborigines, even more so than Cao Shigui. Seven or eight out of every ten among them were clothed and shaved their heads, the others having long hair and being barefoot. The male Aborigines had pieces of native cloth or deerskin in front of and behind their private parts, while the females had several pieces of native cloth for their private parts and to cover their upper body. Their sleeves are coarse, and the quality of cloth ragged and not covering the entire body. Breastfed infants were slung on the back without a stitch, indicating their dire poverty. It was an unbearable sight. These records of clothing and infants show that Liu Yunke observed the problem of living standards among Aborigines. On the 15th day of the 5th month, Liu Yunke made his way to the Maolan sub-tribe and discovered new land there being illegally farmed. He ordered the buildings be razed, the crops cut down, and the perpetrators caught. The illegal settlers immediately fled. He then proceeded to Shenlu and Mugalan. He then traversed two small mountains and traveled more than 20 li to arrive at the Pu sub-tribe. Pu Li and Mei Li, with their flat and open terrain, had adjoining fields, covering an area of 60 or 70 li, as far as the eye could see. 
This was the premier tribal area of them all, which is why illegal farming was more serious there. Liu estimated that more than a thousand jia of land was being illegally farmed in the Puli sub-tribe area. Liu Yunke ordered someone to summon row dancer Li Tai Rong to hunt down Xu Zhuangqi, an assimilated aborigine related through marriage. Investigation had revealed that Xu Zhuangqi had committed major heinous offenses against the Mei subtribe, including kidnapping, stealing oxen, raising buildings, desecrating tombs, and stealing funerary axes from them, and claiming land. The next day, Liu Unke ordered Shi Mi, Ye Changchun, and others to capture Shu Zhuangqi, return the stolen goods, and release his captives. After deliberating with Tao Shigui, it was thought that only by removing evil could order be restored, so it was decided to have Shu Zhuangqi executed locally to appease the assimilated aborigines and calm the assimilated ones. On the 18th day, Xu was executed on the western outskirts. On the 19th day, Liu Unke traveled back from the Mei sub-tribe, passing Tiejen Mountain and going through Guo Shui Wei, he ascended Songbo Peak and crossed Chou Shui River to arrive at the Wai Guoxing wastelands. On the 20th day, he crossed south of the river and traveled west, seeing Wai Guoxing, Da Pinglin, and the 99 peaks of Huoye mountain north of the river at Putun Yuan, the mountains and flowing waters gave rise to the name Wu River. They then went to Neimu Shan, where Han Chinese and Aborigines interacted, then to Beitou. He ascended Tong'an Peak and after 20 li arrived at Changhua County. After returning to Changhua, Liu Unke was completely exhausted and suffered dizziness owing to previous health problems. He nonetheless arrived back in Tamshui on the 24th day of the fifth month and then went to Mongjia, Wanhua, and, after inspecting the troops, went to Bali Bun. On the first day of the sixth month, he wrote a memorial to the court, requesting two months' leave. On the seventh day, he set sail, but encountered a typhoon along the way and was blown off course to Songxia in Changle County, Fujian. The fright only made his condition even worse. After Liu Yunke recovered, how did he describe what he had seen? What was his attitude concerning the development of the six sub-tribes of Sazum? What kind of difficult questions were there between developing the land or not? Fujian Liu Yunke showed more sympathy for the unassimilated aborigines. He felt that unassimilated aborigines did not know how to farm, leaving the land fallow and making survival difficult for themselves. And those privately renting out land to assimilated aborigines often shortchanged or cheated them. That's why the aborigines hoped the court would agree to opening the land to cultivation to also protect their own investment. If the emperor did not agree to cultivation, unassimilated aborigines would find life increased increasingly difficult, and assimilated aborigines would find life increasingly disorderly. Liu Unke felt that the mechanism of erecting boundary markers and establishing defenses was no longer feasible to prevent illegal encroachment. If cultivation was legalized, unassimilated aborigines could earn some rent and have something to fill their bellies, and assimilated aborigines could work the land and engage in activities beneficial to their health and all. The grand academicians and ministers of state Mujanga and Pan Shi'en, with grand academicians Jioro Baoxing and Zhuo 
Bing Tian, Assistant Grand Academicians Qi Ying and Chen Guanjun, and Vice Ministers of Revenue and War held a meeting and responded to the question of whether to open the six sub-tribes of Sazum to development. These officials came to the conclusion that the Aboriginal peoples submit with sincerity. There is no qualm about their honesty, but the real qualm is first showing sincerity and then turning to dissipation. The question of cultivating Aboriginal land is not currently about its disadvantages, but the inherent problems from might arise later. In 1847, to survey and find out if the six subtribes area of Sazum was suitable for cultivation or not, Tao Shigui went on orders of Liu Yunke twice to visit the area of Sazum, one of them in company of Liu himself. In his diaries, not only does he record in detail the natural scenery, customs of the Aborigines, and situation of cultivation, he paid particular attention to the poverty of unassimilated Aborigines. After Minister of State Mujanga and other officials decided to disagree about opening up Sazum, Liu Unke returned home, retiring from office and going home, and never set foot in Taiwan again. His memorial on surveying the six subtribes of Sazum appears both in the palace archive and the Grand Council, and the opinions of Minister of State Mujanga and others can be found in the archives of the Grand Council. These records are now part of the National Palace Museum collection, forming extremely important documents about the history of Taiwan, and the official opening of the land would not occur until Shen Baozhen came to Taiwan to open the mountains and pacify the Aborigines, finally settling the matter. 透過柳運科的這個文獻的記載他與少族人接觸的那個過程當然這個是一個新舊的時代的交替的他的社名他的位置他经过的那些重要的交通的要道那些重要的那些地标我们现在其实都还可以复原比如说他提到的积极铺就是现在的积极镇他里头提到的那个水里坑他提到的那个那个鸡胸林这个现在我们在地图上都还能够找得到那个地点 through personal experience, Cao Shigui was struck by impressions of magical scenery in the Sazum area. And Liu Yunke was even more so impressed by the natural beauty there, coming away with an idea of the differences between Chinese and Aboriginal culture. In particular, he saw the poverty of life among Aborigines and made a decision with their livelihood as a priority. Despite these historical impressions of Sazum, court officials decided not to bring Sazum under cultivation. However, the desire of these two figures to benefit the people and their concern have been recorded for posterity in Qing Dynasty memorials, now in the National Palace Museum. In the midst of beautiful scenery, they did not forget the fundamentals of the people's livelihood and national security. 
Their historical impressions reflect the situation of different peoples in a land of abundance.